Yeah. That's you. That's you. Yeah, you're live on the internet. Yes, that's you. Can you see yourself? <laughs> Wee. Wee. There. Yeah. Yeah, okay. We're going to get ready now and do a... Here. Are you going out with mom? Come on out. We're going to get ready to do a video chat. Come on. Come on. Yes, I know. Come on. Go out with mom. Here. Yeah. Hello, Total Fitness Bodybuilders. How's it going? Lee Hayward here. And as you've seen, we had Harvey joining us uh, earlier <laughs> at the beginning of the video chat. Now, today, what I want to cover in today's Total Fitness Bodybuilding video chat is some strategies for getting lean and shredded. And I actually sent out an email, and if some of you probably have received that email. And in this video chat, we're going to go over some of the key principles that need to be in place in order for you to achieve fat loss success. And this is gonna be a bit different than a regular video chat. It's not just going to be uh, you know, straight on Q&A, even though I do encourage you to post some Q&A if you do have any questions about what I'm discussing here today during our video chat. But we're gonna go into what's involved and specifically the mindset that goes behind getting in shape and this is one of the most important things and it's one of the most neglected aspects a lot of people really don't focus on the mindset and they just focus on the how-to and i'm going to tell you right now all the how-to in the world is not going to make a row of beans in difference if you don't have the proper mindset to back it up and the proper strategies to back it up because let's face it you have access to all the how-to information that you physically need I mean, you don't need another workout program. You don't need another diet plan. You don't need another macronutrient formula. I mean, you can go in on YouTube and find all the different diet plans that you want. You can find all the different workout plans that you want. Even on my channel, I have you know numerous workout training series that you can follow. I have uh, programs, you know, both video as well as uh, downloadable eBooks and reports that explain all the things that you need to do when it comes to the diet. But all the how-to doesn't matter unless you have the mindset and the structure in place to make that how-to actually applicable. So that's what we're going to cover uh, today. Now I'm just going to get a couple of things organized on my end. And for those of you who are tuned in live right now, can you just make sure that everything is coming through loud and clear? I, it usually does, but I always want to make sure before I actually get into the whole meat and potatoes and the content of our video chats that everything is coming through loud and clear, that you can hear me, see me, and all that good stuff. So I'm just going to uh, get some stuff organized here on my end. All right. Good, good, okay. Seems we got the video chat coming through there. Excellent. All right, so one of the things that we're going to discuss first, oops, my screen set up here, is when you need to structure a, a training and nutrition program to, you know, whether that is for fat loss, which I know it is for a lot of people, whether that is for building lean mass, or it is a combination of both. You know, perhaps you want to lose that belly fat while building up some lean mass in the process. And I know for a lot of people, that is what they want. They want a combination of both. They want to recomposition their body. And one of the things that you really need to focus on is the motivation. What is your true motivation and how motivated are you to reach that goal? Like if you were to look at it, say like on a scale of one to 10, how motivated are you towards achieving that particular goal of yours? And if it's anything less than a 10, your odds of success are pretty darn low. And I'm going to tell you that right up front. I mean, if you just say, yeah, I'd like to get in shape, but, or I'd like to do it as long as it doesn't take too much work, or as long as it doesn't inconvenience me, or as long as I can do blah, blah, blah. If you have any of these, yeah, buts, then that's going to limit the chances of you actually achieving your goal. And I'm going to tell you right up front. 
And you need to really look at how much do you want to achieve this? And I'm gonna give you an example from uh, competitive bodybuilders. Because whenever I've been working with people, helping them with their nutrition programs, with their training programs, those who get the most results are competitive bodybuilders, uh, those who get the most significant before and after transformations. And there's a reason for that. One is they're highly motivated because it's not just for them, it's they have something on the line. They're going to actually be displaying their physique, displaying their, their results on stage in front of a panel of judges, in front of an auditorium full of spectators, and they're going to be compared to others. So there's a lot on the line. They're putting themselves out there. So the motivation to actually achieve their goal of getting lean, ripped, muscular is way higher than the average person who has nothing on the line. So, I mean, if you're just like, yeah, I'd like to get in shape, but there's no deadline, there's, there's no consequences. If I don't get in shape, then the odds of you actually achieving that are very slim to none. So the why is a big one. Uh, another thing you need to look at is the pain of not achieving the goal. What's going to happen if you don't achieve it? Now, in the case of a competitive bodybuilder, if they don't achieve their goal, they're probably going to feel embarrassed. They're going to be humiliated. They're going to feel like they don't belong on stage, right? And I mean, that there's a bit of an ego going on there, which in the right context can actually be beneficial. It can actually help you with the process. But there's some consequences. They're going to feel like they didn't uh, live up to their expectations. They're going to feel embarrassed, which, you know, that's a huge motivating factor. So that's very often why you see a lot of competitive bodybuilders and athletes succeeding, whereas your average weekend warrior doesn't achieve the same results. Uh, another one that I see a lot, and this is with coaching students that I, I work with, is sometimes the pain isn't great enough to change. You know, yes, they would like to see some results. Yes, they'd like to make some progress, you know, build muscle, lose the gut. But there's there's no real consequences or pain if they don't achieve it until it gets to the point where it is a serious issue. And I'll use an example. Like, let's just say we have someone who's been smoking cigarettes their entire life. You know, they know they shouldn't smoke. They know there's health consequences to smoking. I mean, intellectually, they know all that, but they continue to smoke. Right. You know, they have in the back of their mind, it's not going to happen to me. And then let's say after several years, all of a sudden the doctor says, you know what, you've got lung cancer. Then all of a sudden their motivation to quit smoking is sky high because they realize, OK, now it is a life and death situation. So they're actually motivated to take action to improve. Whereas before, when the pain wasn't great enough, there was no motivation there. And the same applies to fitness. You know, if, if you're overweight and out of shape. Yeah, you intellectually know, okay, I should do this for my health. I know I should improve and this and that. But then when it comes to the point where, okay, you've had a heart attack and now it's a life and death situation, or now you've been diagnosed with diabetes and it's gotten to the point where you're at risk of saying like getting your leg amputated because the, the complications from diabetes have gotten so great, or there's some major complication on the line, then your motivation for actually taking action is sky high. But unfortunately, by the time it gets to that point where the pain is so great that you're willing to do whatever it takes, by the time the pain gets to that level, very often the damage is done and it's irreversible. So you kind of have to uh, future pace and think, what are your current actions going to lead in the future? So if, if right now the path you're leading, your path that you're on is taking you to a place you don't want to go, where is this going to take you in the next you know, 10, 20 years. So, I mean, if you're overweight and out of shape and you know, okay, you have some minor health issues now, but it's not bad enough for you to take action, just kind of future pace and see, where is this going to lead me in the future if I keep doing what I'm doing? And kind of visualize the pain and visualize the negativity in advance. And hopefully you can live some of that pain now and motivate yourself to actually take action. And one of the things I often say to some of my, uh, coaching students who are in this situation where they're not a 10 out of 10 in motivation. You know, they, they would like to get in shape as long as they don't have to work too hard to do it. I'd say, well, let's look and, you know, make it bigger than you. Like, let's say you're, you're a parent, you have a, a young child. I mean, that's the situation I'm in. And what if you don't take action and you can't see your child grow up? 
you know, maybe you're at risk of developing heart disease, or maybe you're at risk of developing diabetes, or maybe you're at risk of some other complication. And you, if the path you're on right now, you keep following that path, maybe you're not going to see your child grow up. Maybe you're not going to live to see your grandchildren. I mean, that might be motivation enough for you to say, you know what, maybe I need to change my actions now. If you think into the future of what the consequences that you're currently doing, where are they going to lead you down the road? So again, you need to have a strong enough why, and you need to have a strong enough pain to move yourself to towards taking action. Because a lot of times the desire for pleasure is not nearly as strong as the desire to avoid pain. So you want to use both like the carrot and the stick. Right, the pleasure aspect of hey, this would be so cool if I could get myself in shape and look and feel better, but also the pain aspect to drive you towards achieving your goal. So that's a big one right there. Another one that holds people back as well is fear fear of failure. You know, what's going to happen if you try and you don't succeed? Right, a lot of people are afraid of it. There's like, well, yeah, I know it can work for some people, you know, they might look at uh, me, for example, they say, well, Lee, you competed in bodybuilding. You've done it before. So, you know, you can do it, but uh, I don't think I can do it. So I'm not even going to try. You know, they had that fear of failure holding them back. And there's another one that is even a bit more messed up, but sometimes it's fear of success. Now, this a lot of people, when you initially hear this, it doesn't make sense. But fear of success actually holds people back to a great degree as well. Because maybe you've associated yourself with a certain identity. Maybe you say, you know what, I'm, I've been overweight and out of shape my whole life. That's just the way I am. That's who I am. And you have a fear of what is it going to be like if you were to change that? Like what if all of a sudden you were lean, athletic, muscular? How is that going to change your identity? You know, because maybe you're thinking now people are going to look at you differently. Maybe if you were lean and in shape that's going to attract a lot of attention that you're not used to having. I'm going to tell you, like, if you go to the beach and you're overweight and out of shape, you're just kind of going to blend in with everybody else who's overweight and out of shape. But if you have that goal, you know, I want to be lean and ripped and hit the beach with a quote unquote beach body, you're going to stand out. You're going to be amongst, you know, the, the top, you know, 3% of people who are there and all of a sudden you're going to get a lot of attention because people are going to be looking at you as someone who's different. And sometimes the fear of success, the fear of standing out can actually make you feel uncomfortable. And another one that I've heard recently, and this is kind of to go along with the whole fear of success, is I remember uh, just recently reading about a woman and she was overweight and out of shape and she wanted to lose weight and get in shape. She wanted to do it but she was holding herself back. And the reason why she was holding herself back is because as a child, she was abused. You know, she was abused sexually as a child. So her defense mechanism to avoid having people abuse her in the future was to be overweight and out of shape. She figured that was like her, her safety net because if she was less attractive, people would be less desired to take advantage of her. So that was actually holding her back. The fear of success in this case was a major mental block, major issues going on. Now, I know that's kind of an extreme case, but at some level, we probably all have our own fear of failure as well as fear of success. So you really need to kind of reprogram your mind and rethink yourself as an individual. And these are some things that are actually limiting your success when it comes to achieving your bodybuilding and fitness goals. Another one that you really need to look at as well is the people you associate with. You've probably heard this before, but you are the average of the five people you associate with the most. Like if you take your friends and family and, and everyone you associate with, chances are the average physique of the people you hang out with, that's your average physique. You know, so if your friends are all overweight and out of shape, then chances are you're probably going to be overweight and out of shape. Vice versa, if you hang out with people who are athletic, go to the gym on a regular basis, are very health conscious, you're more likely to be athletic going to the gym and very health conscious. So we tend to become like the people we associate with. So if you were to change your lifestyle, change your habits, and become a different version of yourself, you'd probably have to upgrade your friends as well. And that may be fearful for some people. 
especially if you have long-term relationships with people you've grown up with and people you've associated with. Like all of a sudden, hey, if you start to, you know, I guess it's kind of like the, the the tall poppy syndrome, you know, you start to stand out, then you're going to just have this disconnect with everybody that you associated with. And sometimes that's necessary in order for you to move to the next level. You sometimes have to break off some of those uh, connections and upgrade your friends and your social circle. And I can tell you in my own case, I've done that. I've done that over the years. I mean, when I was like younger and, and going to college and some of the friendships that I, I developed in those days, they weren't based on anything of substance. It was just based on, I, I was around these people on a regular basis. And then, you know, on the weekend we would go to house parties or we'd go out to nightclubs and, you know, there was often the, the friendship was based around alcohol and, and negative associations like that. There weren't any strong connections. Now, as I've gotten older, I've realized that that's not the life that I want to live. And I've chose to, you know, I personally don't drink alcohol anymore and I haven't for, for several years. So obviously a lot of the friendships that I have that were all based around alcohol and nightclubs and, and that kind of environment, I don't, I no longer have those friendships and associations and I have different friendships and associations now instead. So that's another thing that can hold you back is the people you're associating with and fear of sometimes moving on away from those people. So this is all deep level stuff. Now, I mean, we can go on and on and talking about this, but a lot of this is the underlining reasons why you're not achieving the results that you want when it comes to your bodybuilding and fitness goals. It has nothing to do with, oh, I need another workout program or, oh, I need another diet plan or, oh, what about my macros? You know, should I have this macro split or that macro split or should I do a keto or an intermittent fasting or a carb cycle or for the most part, none of that stuff matters. It's the underlining root, you know, the, the mental blocks that are holding you back from achieving your success. So if you have a strong enough reason why you have a support system and a group of people who are actually encouraging you to reach your goals, that's going to be conducive to you actually moving forward and achieving those goals. Whereas if if you had the best plan in place, you know, you had the best workout, you've got the best uh, nutrition plan, you've got the best gym, you've got the best supplements, you've got everything going in place, but you don't have the mindset and the foundation, none of that stuff matters. And I mean, I can tell you from, from doing this for a long time, I mean, I've been coaching people for over 20 years and I've, I've had a lot of deep conversations with people and I see that, you know, they have all the things going for them in terms of the, the mechanics and the how to, but they don't have that foundation of the proper mindset and of, as also the proper support system in terms of their friends and family and social network. And that's what's actually holding them back from achieving their goals. So give this some serious thought. I want you to kind of do an evaluation of your own situation and see what are the issues that are holding you back from reaching your goals. And if you're honest with yourself, chances are it's not the mechanics. It's not the lack of a workout. It's not the lack of a diet plan. It's an underlining mental or emotional issue that needs to be dealt with first. And of course, I don't have the, the answers for everybody because, I mean, it's, it's an individual thing. I mean, what's holding one person back might be totally different from what's holding another person back. But I just wanted to share this with you and give you some food for thought because it is very powerful. Now, with that being said, let's move into some of the mechanics that you can use to help change your situation and to actually start moving yourself in the right direction towards building a lean, ripped athletic physique. And I'm going to use some of the strategies that I've implemented over the years back when I was competing in bodybuilding competitions, because this is where I can have um, the most, this is where I've had the most success over the years. And this is where I can really uh, outline a step-by-step -step plan of action. Now, in the past, when I started competing in bodybuilding, I used to uh, read the magazines, read the different programs, and people, you know, the common thing was to do a 12-week contest diet. And that's what I started doing myself back when I was, uh, you know, just getting started with bodybuilding. I figured, okay, 12 weeks out, I'm going to start getting ready for a competition. And over the course of 12 weeks, I did make some good progress, but I always found that in my early competitions, I was lean but not ripped 
And if, if you're new to bodybuilding competition, you can probably relate to this. You know, it's, it's a common rookie mistake. You show up on stage not realizing how lean you actually need to be in order to be competitive. So I would get lean, but not ripped. And what I found was uh, it, it was just, I, I diet hard, I push myself, and sometimes you know I, I'd stick with that 12 week diet plan. And I've realized you can only push yourself so hard, but like you can only diet so hard, you can only do so much exercise, you can only push yourself so hard physically, and the fat is only going to drop at a certain rate. So if you have more fat to lose, rather than trying to diet harder and force yourself to lose the fat faster, how about take a different approach and just diet longer? Hmm, right? That's kind of a, an eye-opening uh, concept here. So I remember back in 1997, it was, that was the year that I actually got ripped for the first time. And uh, I can actually show some pictures uh, you know, if, if in fact, if I have them on my website, if you go to my website, you see some of the old pictures, but 97 was the year that I got ripped for the first time and how I did it was I just dieted longer. So my plan of attack then was instead of having a 12 week diet plan, like I had for the competitions before that, I said, I'm going to start six months out. So instead of three months out, which is 12 weeks, I started six months out and my goal was by the three month out uh, mark, I want to be in my normal contest shape and then diet down from that level of leanness because I'm not naturally a lean person. I'm, I'm kind of, you know, naturally, if, if I don't focus on my diet and training and I get slack, I pile on the weight rather quickly, right? So I have those endomorphic tendencies to my physique. So that's what I did instead is I started the diet earlier. And instead of trying to diet harder, I just dieted longer. And I found that uh, by doing that, it actually allowed me to easier in, in the transition. And I was able to get lean enough that was necessary in order to get on stage and actually be ripped for the first time. So I'm going to break down a six month plan of action that you can take if that is a goal of yours in order to get lean and uh, lean and shredded. Because so that was the, the topic of this whole video chat is strategies to get shredded. So month one when you're following a fat loss diet plan, just focus on improving your current eating plan. Don't have a, a strict plan in place. Don't think, you know, I need to be counting my macros or, or thinking that, you know, I, I need to be going low carb or keto or intermittent fasting or anything like that. For month one, just focus on cleaning up your current program. So if there are foods in your diet that you're eating right now that you know shouldn't be there, i.e. junk food, sweets, you know, any processed foods that you know shouldn't be there. I mean, maybe you go to the drive-thru and you have, you know, fast food or takeaway or, or, you know, anything like that, then cut that out of the diet and focus on replacing it with natural unprocessed foods. So step one is just to clean up your current eating plan. There's no calorie restriction involved here. There's nothing extreme, and you're not going to deprive yourself. You're just going to improve the quality of what it is that you're eating. Focus on the quality, and that is going to move you in the right direction. And very often, a lot of people, by just doing this, you'll probably lose several pounds of body fat and actually sometimes even increase your lean muscle mass because of the quality of the nutrition that you're consuming and the consistency with your nutrition. So that's step one, just clean up the diet. Don't even worry about just depriving yourself or cutting calories, just focus on improving the quality. In addition to that, I would bump up your cardio if you're not already doing you know, adequate cardio in your program. So in my case, I usually would do about a half hour of cardio a day and make better food choices. Boom, that's it. Step one, do that for a full month. After that, then I would focus on getting a bit more strict with my meals and also bumping up the cardio a bit more. So what I would plan on then after that first month of just cleaning things up, I would be a bit more strategic and I'd say, okay, now I want to do uh, fasted cardio in the morning. Now I know this is a bit of a controversial topic, but I've always found that doing fasted cardio worked really well for me. And it still does. I still like to do that as one of my fat loss strategies. And there's two reasons. One, I mean, you can tap into burning a lot of stored body fat when you do cardio fasted. But it also gives you motivation to get that cardio done first thing so that it's, it's done and out of the way. And then you can get on with the rest of your day. 
So it's, it's motivation and it's also effective. So I'd always start my day with some fasted cardio and then I would make sure that I structured my meals in such a way that I ate the majority of my carbohydrate intake after exercise. So I'll give you an example of a typical day. Uh, wake up in the morning, I usually have maybe a cup of coffee or something like that just to give me a bit of a caffeine pick me up, do my cardio, and then I would have my breakfast after cardio. And that breakfast usually consisted of a source of lean protein and complex carbohydrates. Could be something like oatmeal and egg whites, uh, you know, something along those lines it was usually my typical breakfast meal. Then for all my midday meals, I would have protein and green veggies. So it would be high protein, low carb, just focusing on protein and, and vegetables. And then I would do a weight training workout in the afternoon, usually like either after school or after work, depending on when it was, because I've been doing this for a long time. I've been doing this back when I was in my college days. And then, of course, after I graduated college, I still followed the same pattern. So whether it was after school or after work, I would do uh, a weight training workout. And then after the weight training workout, I'd have another meal with protein and complex carbohydrates. So my main sources of carbs always came after exercise. Exercise in the morning with the cardio, exercise in the afternoon with the weight training. And then for all the other meals, I focused on just low, low carb, high protein, and green veggies, as well as some healthy fat. So that was my strategy in terms of meal structure. And that was what I would do for month two of the program. And I found that that worked really well for taking the fat loss to another level. And I would also probably bump up the cardio a bit. So if I started with a half hour a day, maybe month two, I'd be bumping it up to around 45 minutes a day. By the time I got to month three, it really depended on how my body was progressing. If I was seeing really good results with that initial plan of, of structuring it so that the carbs were primarily after exercise, then I would continue with it. I mean, if, if it's working, just keep the momentum going. I mean, if it's working, you don't need to fix it because it's already working. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. But if I found that my fat loss was hitting a plateau and starting to stall, then I would implement usually a carbohydrate cycle strategy. And how this works, and this is an advanced strategy that I've used for a lot of my coaching students, and I've used it for myself, was I would go through a phase of high carbohydrates, a phase of moderate carbohydrates, and then a phase of low carbohydrates. And how it usually worked was I would structure it to go in line with the days of the week. So for example, let's say uh, Saturday and Sunday, I'm going to have high carbs. And I always like to have my high carbs on the weekend because that's when, for most people, your, your schedule is kind of changed when you're, you know, on the weekend. You usually like during Monday to Friday, you're at work, you're at school, you're at whatever it is that you do on the weekend. That's kind of your bit of free time. So I always like to have a bit of more flexibility with my diet on the weekend and have the ability to eat more food. And it also kind of worked in line with any family get togethers because that's usually when people like go out to dinner or they, you know, have a family dinner like for us, you know, like Sunday dinner with the family and stuff like that. And I always found that it worked well if I allowed myself extra calories, extra carbs on the weekend. So Saturday, Sunday was always high carb days. Then Monday, Tuesday would be medium carb days. And the medium carb days will be like I mentioned before, having the carbs after exercise. So carbs for breakfast in my case, carbs for dinner, and then all the other meals will be low carb. And then I'd follow that up with a few days of true low carb dieting where all the meals were just lean protein, green veggies, and some healthy fat. No starchy carbs or no simple carbs at all. And I'd rotate through that, that structured program. So phases of high carbs, medium carbs, low carbs. And by doing this, it helps to optimize your metabolic rate because what you'll find happening is you'll fill up your glycogen stores during those high carb days. So you'll feel almost like you're, you're in a clean bulking phase. So you'll refill your glycogen stores. You'll feel strong. You'll feel energetic. You'll be able to train heavier in the gym and fill yourself out. Then as you taper down through the medium carb days and then to the low carb days, you really get into burning body fat but you're also depleting yourself. You're depleting the glycogen stores. So by the time you get to the end of that low carb phase, you're feeling a bit flat and depleted. Even though it's good for fat loss, you're feeling flat and depleted and the food cravings are starting to kick in as well. And then that's when you would transition back into another phase of high carbs. So it was 
it worked well mentally as well as physically because one of the drawbacks to traditional dieting is if you have to go for a prolonged period of time with very low calories and very low uh, carbs, it's hard. I mean, it's mentally and physically hard. And you, you start to have, you know, you feel deprived and you want to, uh, you have the temptations to cheat on your diet if you go for a prolonged period of time. But if you structure it so that you only have to diet strict for a few days at a time before you get a little break, then it makes it mentally and physically easier. So instead of thinking, oh shit, I got to diet for, for 12 weeks in a row and, you know, deprive myself, all you have to really think of is I'm going to do a little mini diet for a few days and then I'm going to get a break. Mini diet for a few days, then I'm going to get a break. And, and that made the process a lot easier when you broke down that big, massive goal into small, manageable chunks. And that was one of the strategies that I found very helpful. So I usually go through that phase. And depending on the situation, sometimes that was good enough to get me to contest shape just by doing that carb cycle diet right there. I know back in my early days when I was in my 20s and my metabolism was, was faster, that was good enough for me to get into peak contest shape, just going through that carb cycle diet over and over again. As I got a bit older, you know, into my 30s and 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 now even into my, uh, you know, I just turned 40 recently, I found that I need to be even stricter with my diet in order to get from lean to ripped. So one of the things that I, I found that I would, was very effective in my most recent competitions uh, that I implemented was a, another strategy where I would literally go uh, low carb all week long. So literally a full week of low carb dieting. So no starchy carbs, no simple carbs, just protein, green veggies, and healthy fat. And then twice a week, I would have a strategic high carb refeed meal. And if, if any of you have followed my extreme fat loss program, you know, this is one that I've offered through my website. It's available on the Total Fitness Bodybuilding Inner Circle member site. That's basically the template for the extreme fat loss program. It's, it's a low carb diet, but it had two strategic high carb refeeds. And I usually space those out uh, throughout the week. So if, in my case, I would have it on Wednesday and Saturday. Those were the days that I found worked best for me. You can have them on any days that you want, but try and space them out so they're a few days apart. So again, Wednesday, Saturday work well. And the way it would work is for the final meal of the day, I would have uh, a high carb meal where I would literally just boatload the carbs in for, for the final meal of the day on Wednesday and the final meal of the day on Saturday. And the reason why this works so well is very often when you are getting food cravings, they usually come later in the day. Like you, you probably realize this yourself. Like you can go all day long, not feeling very hungry, not feeling, you know, any particular food cravings, but then later in the day, that's when the cravings hit. You know, that's when you feel your appetite starting to spike. And by doing this, it actually worked well because I would have those high carb meals when my appetite was the highest, when my cravings were the highest. So to give me a lot of eating satisfaction by doing that. And for these high carb meals, it was traditional high carb food. I mean, it was might be uh, rice, pasta, oatmeal, sweet potatoes, regular potatoes, whatever. But I would have generous portions and literally eat until I was satisfied, sometimes a little bit oversatisfied and purposely stuff myself with these high carb foods and I do that twice a week and I found that by doing that it helped to satisfy those cravings because again as I mentioned you only have to diet for a few days in a row then you get a break right diet for a few days in a row get a break so it satisfied me mentally but it also helped to refill the glycogen stores physically so then in the day after that high carb meal I'd feel full strong glycogen stores topped up so that would be an ideal time to train your weak, stubborn body parts is during, you know, when you're in a carb fed state because you get a better pump, you get it, a, you know, help stimulate more muscle growth, feel stronger in the gym. So I'd always structure my workouts so that I was training my most stubborn body parts right after that high carb refeed and then go a couple days of low carbs to really tap into that stored body fat again before repeating the cycle. And I found that that worked really well for uh, going from lean to ripped. And as I got older, I found that it actually worked better for my metabolism. So that was the strategy that I used to use a lot uh, for my last few bodybuilding shows where I ultimately hit my best peak condition ever. Now, 
as I've gotten even older, one of the strategies that I like to use now as more of a fat loss, even maintenance type of diet is intermittent fasting. That's This is something that I've been experimenting with now over the past year or so. And I find that it works well for people who are trying to uh, either lose fat or maintain a lean physique. And uh, the, the way intermittent fasting works, I mean, there's a lot of, of information online about it, but bottom line is you're going to go for a prolonged period of time without eating. And this kind of goes counterintuitive to traditional bodybuilding diet, you know, ideas where people say, hey, you need to have small frequent meals throughout the day. By intermittent fasting, you're purposely going to go maybe 12, 16, or even longer, you know, hours without having any food at all. So you'll have this big, long period of fasting, which is great for tapping into stored body fat, and this also helps to uh, you know, give your digestive system a break. And then you have a short feeding opportunity window each day. So sometimes I, you know, the typical strategy that a lot of people do is they might skip breakfast, uh, skip lunch, have an early dinner, and then have a couple you know, small meals or snacks in the evening, and then start the whole process again. Now, in my case, I don't have a super strict uh, protocol for intermittent fasting at this stage because I'm using it more of a maintenance diet, not necessarily a, a really hardcore fat loss diet, even though you could tip it, tip the scales in favor of hardcore fat loss if you wanted to. But I usually set it up so that I have a minimum of a 12-hour fast every day. And sometimes it's longer than that, but at the bottom line, it's usually a minimum of 12 hours. And the reason for that is because it typically takes your digestive system 12 hours to process the food that's in your system. So by the time you eat something, for the most part, within 12 hours, that food has passed through your digestive system. So if you want to kind of clear yourself out and get a little break to the digestive system, you need to have a minimum of a 12-hour fast. Now, if you go longer than that, that's even better. Uh, better for fat loss as well as giving your digestive system a break. But if you want to get the, the benefits of intermittent fasting, you need that 12-hour fast minimum. Now, I found that in my case, it's a lot more convenient, especially if, if you're busy with work, you're busy with family, you've got other responsibilities. Because now, you know, in the early part of the day, you don't need to be worrying about your meals. You don't need to be planning out, you know, okay, what am I going to eat for breakfast? What am I going to eat for lunch? You know, am I going to have to pack all my Tupperware containers and carry that around with me throughout the day? It's it's so much more convenient when you can just focus on doing your tasks for the day without having to worry about food. You'll be so much more productive. And when you get into the habit of it, it's actually, you know, it, it's not that difficult. It's really not. It's it's Once you get into the pattern of intermittent fasting, a lot of people find that it's actually easier to go for a prolonged period of time without eating and not feeling hungry because your body actually starts to get into fat burning mode and you're burning that stored body fat for energy. And then, of course, you could even help to curb your appetite by drinking water, drinking green tea, drinking black coffee, things like that, which will give you a bit of energy and it'll also help to blunt your appetite. So that's usually what I do throughout the day. Uh, you know, first thing in the morning now, uh, I'll drink some water to help rehydrate my body. And then I'll probably have a cup of coffee, maybe a cup of green tea. And I do that throughout the day. And that's enough to tide over my appetite and give me a little bit of an energy pick me up. And then I usually do my workout uh, either in the afternoon while I'm still fasted. Uh, and then afterwards have dinner with the family. And then I might have some uh, other, you know, high nutrient snacks throughout the evening to make up my uh, caloric and macronutrient intake for the day. And I find that it works really well and it's very convenient for most people. So that's the strategy that I'm currently using right now. And I find that it's a good strategy for maintenance. But if, if you want to uh, go through this whole process, you see the, the structure that I've laid out. I wouldn't recommend someone who's brand new to fat loss nutrition to start with intermittent fasting. Uh, I think that would be a mistake because if if you just jump into intermittent fasting right from the get-go and you haven't developed the foundation of proper nutrition habits, uh, it can lead to even worse habits because what happens is if you deplete yourself all day long and then you're hungry, a lot of times that leads people to make poor food choices. So you, you often see like people who are new to intermittent fasting and hear that, hey, I can fast all day long and then eat what I want. 
Well, they'll probably, you know, make poor food choices and order takeout or eat fast food or eat a lot of junk food. Whereas you really need to have the fundamentals of nutrition. Because even following an intermittent fasting program, you can still get fat or at least not lose fat if you're making poor food choices, even if you have a big fasted window every day. I mean, if, right, for example, like if, if you fast 16 hours a day and then through your, uh, you know, your, your eight hour feeding window, if you're eating junk food and chips and ice cream and pizza, you can still get fat even though you're intermittent fasting, right? I mean, I've seen a lot of people do that. You know, and that's that's one of the things that you don't want to do. You want to have a structured meal plan in place, but focus on the, the food quality and just use the intermittent fasting as a strategy to make it more convenient and help give your digestive system a break. So that is an overview of how the whole process works. And as a little bonus gift for those of you who tuned in and are listening to this whole video chat up to this point, I have. Uh, a book that I'd like to give you and it's a book that I wrote called your first bodybuilding competition and it is a six-month training guide where I outline in detail the concept that I just explained here on this video chat so the way it works is this program it's over a hundred page ebook that I've written and it outlines everything from how to get go from six months out to contest shredded now whether you're planning on competing in a bodybuilding competition or not is kind of irrelevant. I mean, obviously, if you are, that would definitely help. But even if you just want to use the strategies of competitive bodybuilders to get ripped for your own personal reasons, maybe you have a beach vacation coming up and you, you know, you'd like to be able to hit the beach looking your best. Or maybe you have some other, you know, something else coming up. Maybe you have a wedding coming up and you'd like to lose some weight and get in shape for your wedding. Or maybe you have like a high school reunion coming up. And you want to get in shape for that. Whatever it is that your motivation is for getting in shape, you can use the same strategies that competitive bodybuilders use for getting ready for competition. And again, I like to refer to competitive bodybuilders because they are amongst the most successful dieters when it comes to fat loss. So I have that book. It's a hundred plus page ebook manual. And if you would like a copy for yourself, just send me an email. And my email address is leeh at leehayward.com. So send me an email and say, Lee, I would like a copy of your ebook. Your <laughs> say, I watched your video chat. I would like a copy of your ebook. Just send me an email to leeh at leehayward.com and I will send you a copy of that. As a totally free, I mean, in the past, I used to charge, uh, I think it was $39.95 for this program back when it was a hard copy program that I had. I used to charge it, but I'm going to give it away totally free for those of you who are watching this video chat right now. And that is a good plan of attack, a good strategy that you can use to help achieve your personal fat loss goals. Now, if you would like some more help with this, you know, maybe you have some issues when it comes to the mindset, or maybe you have some issues when it comes to making the program work for you and you would like some more personal help with it, then I am willing to offer a coaching call, a one-on-one -on -one coaching call, if you would like to discuss this in person. And if you want, like say you just mentioned that in your email and we can schedule a time to jump on the phone and have a chat together and come up with a realistic strategy to help you achieve your personal muscle building and fat loss goals. So with that being said, now I'm going to jump into the questions that have been coming through live because I know we have uh, a lot of people tuned in here and I'm sure there's been a lot of questions coming through. All right, so I'm just going to quickly uh, jump through here. I know there's a fair number of questions here. So if there's anything that I discussed with regards to, uh, you know, the, the different diet strategies, how to take yourself from just cleaning up your diet to going into, uh, you know, the, the carb time diet to the carb cycle diet to the low carb uh, extreme fat loss diet. If you have any questions related to any of those different strategies, feel free to post them in the video chat window. And uh, I'll be running through there now and answering them. So we have Abby is joining us. We have Jonah's joining us. Uh, let's see what else. Daniel is joining us. Uh, Daniel saying, uh, what are your macro split and calorie intake? Um, that really depends on what phase of the diet we would be in, right? So, I mean, uh, for example, in the uh, with the, the carb cycle diet, for example, 
uh, you would go through phases of high carbs, medium carbs, and low carbs. And so the, the macro split would vary depending on where you are. If you're in the high carb phase, uh, obviously the macro, the, sorry, the carbohydrate ratio would be much higher, probably 50% or more of your caloric intake would be coming from carbs. In the medium carb phase, uh, the carbohydrate intake and fat and protein would probably be more well balanced. You probably have like a third split of each. And then, of course, in the low carb days, uh, the most of your caloric intake will come from protein and healthy fat, while the carbs will be very low. But the, the split would vary depending on what phase you're in. And of course, if you want to see some actual sample diet plans with, with foods and meals and everything else outlined, that's covered in uh, the book, Your First Bodybuilding Competition, which I am willing to give away for free. All you have to do is ask. Just send me an email, leeh at leehayward.com. That's L-E-E-H at leehayward, L-E-E-H-A-Y-W-A-R-D.com. Send me an email there, and I will uh, send you a copy of that book totally free. And that outlines sample meal plans that you can follow along with. Uh, Admittance is joining us, and he uh, he was he was on the video chat earlier when he seen Harvey. If if you were on the video chat when I first went live, uh, <laughs> my son was actually here, and he was he was looking at himself on the screen here, right? Because he could see the camera, looking at himself on the screen. He was fascinated. He does that from time to time. He likes to get into my videos and uh, and watch himself on the video screen. Uh, Wilfred is Wilfredo is joining us. He says, Lee, can you get lean and ripped without cardio? That is technically yes. Technically, yes. All you really need is diet and weight training. And if you do that, you can get lean and ripped. But I'm going to tell you from, from a practical personal experience, if you are struggling with fat loss, it will be easier, in my opinion, to get lean with cardio. And the, the reason for that is, is not just because of the calories that you're burning with with cardio but it's easier to keep yourself more physically active when you incorporate cardio into your routine and i'm going to give you an example here with weight training obviously you do burn a lot of calories when you're weight training but it's a high intensity exercise it's breaking down your muscle tissue it's stressing your central nervous system your central nervous system and it causes you know you can overtrain with weight training quite easily so, I mean, if, if you're pushing yourself with weights hard and heavy, say six days a week, you, you're at risk of, of pushing yourself to the point of overtraining. Whereas if you were to space that out with maybe like weight training one day and cardio the next, weight training one day and cardio the next, you can have that daily exercise in your program without stressing your body out because the cardio is a form of lower intensity exercise, still elevating your metabolism, still burning body fat, allows you to keep more active without breaking down your muscle tissue. So if you did a hard weight training workout today and then did cardio tomorrow, during that cardio session, you're actually providing some active recovery for your body. So it's, it's exercise that's helping to rejuvenate your body without breaking it down. So you're flushing blood and nutrients throughout the muscles, you're helping to speed up your metabolic rate, and it's a gentle, easy form of exercise. So I like to refer to it almost like yin and yang workouts, right? You have the high intensity uh, weight training and then the low intensity cardio. And when you combine both of them together, they're very complementary and it allows you to increase your overall activity level without stressing up your body. Now, if you want to push it even further and, you know, you, you can do like daily cardio in addition to weight training, maybe three or four days a week. And that's one of the strategies that I would use, like, especially when I was getting ready for bodybuilding shows, I would do like cardio in the morning, weight training in the afternoon or vice versa, whatever works best for your, for your schedule. But by having both types of training in there, you would actually help to spike your metabolic rate uh, twice per day rather than just once. And it would actually help to speed up fat loss. But so to answer your question, can you get lean without cardio? Yes, you can. If you diet strict and you're still and you're doing your weight training, you can still get lean without it. But from a practical point of view, it's easier to get lean with it. So I'll just leave it at that. OK, um, we have Sky Hunters joining us. Amir is joining us. Crossfire. 
Mittens, Jonas, Operation Truth. Uh, Operation Truth saying sets and reps. He says four to five sets for 15 reps with progressive overload build muscle. I'm not sure if that was a question or a statement, but there it is. <laughs> uh, Azim is saying looks like winter has arrived in Newfoundland. Yeah, it's actually, it, it wasn't snowing, but we had freezing rain today. So the, the temperature is just above, is, is right on that freezing mark. It's just like zero to, uh, you know, maybe like one or two degrees. And we actually had some uh, freezing rain. So, yeah, the weather is definitely getting a lot colder here. Uh, we have Charles joining us. What are your thoughts on taking apple cider vinegar for energy? Apple cider vinegar. Uh, this is, the, you can go Google search. I mean, there's a lot of information about apple cider vinegar, you know, in terms of the health benefits to help with uh, detoxing your body. Uh, some say it helps aid with fat loss. Um, one of the things, uh, sometimes I like to use it uh, in in the morning as, as like a part of like an intermittent fasting program. You can use it to help aid with, with fat burning as, as well as aid with detox. Um, it also can help to curb your appetite as well. Like if you drink apple cider vinegar, like have a couple spoonfuls and a big glass of water, it can help to uh, curb your appetite. So if you do find that you... Uh, have some cravings and you know you're trying to keep your your calories low then you can actually use apple cider vinegar to, in sort of like a crutch to help you uh, get through uh, some of the, the low calorie dieting phases is it absolutely necessary no but by no means i mean throughout the majority of my uh, you know bodybuilding competitions i've never ever used apple cider vinegar like back when i was competing throughout the, the late 90s and throughout the early 2000s, I never used any apple cider vinegar whatsoever. And I was able to get, you know, lean and ripped in contest condition. Um, you know, it's it's become more popular in recent years, but, uh, you know, is it, it, can it help? Yeah, it can help. Is it necessary? Absolutely not. So it's really an optional thing on your part. Okay. Just going to scroll through here. Um, uh, Sharon is joining us, and she says, uh, "She says, do you have something for women? And, you know, to want some fat loss strategies for women." And I'm going to tell you that the strategies that I covered throughout this video chat, as well as the strategies that are covered in my uh, bodybuilding competition training guide, they apply for both men and women. And I'll give you a prime example. My wife, uh, Patricia, she used to compete with me, like, we, and we would follow the same type of program. Obviously, you know, the, the portion sizes would be a bit lower for a woman, uh, but it was the same structure. You know, she'd go through the carb cycle diet just the same as I would, you know, do the same structure in terms of the weight training, the cardio. Everything was the same. It was just the, the portion sizes were adjusted based on her body weight. But the, the same strategies for losing fat would apply for men as well as women. I mean, both men and women have the same basic metabolism. We have the same major muscle groups. We have, you know, there, there are a lot of similarities, right? I know a lot of people try and say, well, this is a man's workout. This is a woman's workout. Or this is a man's diet. This is a woman's diet. It, it's, it's not as – there's more similarities than there are differences. So, I mean, the, the structure and the plan that I've outlined here would apply for a woman as well. Okay, what else we have? Heath is joining us. Arthur is joining us. Saying he loves watching the videos. Agent, Agenticas, I think it's his name. Uh, he says, thanks for the video chat. If someone weighs 135 pounds, how much protein should they take in per day? The, the general rule of thumb for, for most bodybuilding diets is that one gram per pound of body weight per day. That's kind of like the, the, the general rule of thumb. And that's a good place to start, right? If, if you're new to bodybuilding nutrition, I would definitely recommend you start there. I know sometimes when people get into a fat loss uh, cutting diet, they may want to bump up their protein intake a little bit more in order to help preserve lean muscle tissue and also to help uh, with their metabolism. Because if you can, like a calorie is not a calorie. You know, if, if you're getting X number of calories from protein, X number of calories from fat, and X number of calories from carbs, uh, the protein calories are actually better for increasing your metabolism. Like if, if you overeat protein, it's less likely that 
the excess protein calories are going to get converted to body fat versus if you were to overeat extra carbohydrates or overeat extra fat. So protein is more metabolically demanding. It's actually going to help to increase your metabolism more so than uh, the same number of calories from carbs or the same number of calories from fat. It's your body has to work harder to digest it, to process it. And plus the protein is going to actually help to uh, rebuild muscle tissue. So if, if you are going to overeat a little bit, overeating protein would actually be more advantageous in a fat loss diet plan. So that's why sometimes you'll see people uh, when they're structuring their, their macros will sometimes bump up their protein intake to even more than one gram per pound, especially when they're into a serious fat loss cutting diet. But again, to keep it simple, that one gram per pound of body weight is a good place to start. Okay. We have Dennis is joining us. Says he just started diet and training for three months now. Switched to three times a week, full body workouts. Still waiting for the belly fat to disappear. Do I need patience for that? Uh, lost uh, nine kilos already. Yes, this is uh, this is part of the process here. You need patience. Okay, you've been doing it for three months. That's good. You've lost nine kilos already. That's really good. That's a sign that you're on the right track. But you still have more fat to lose. Right. Like I mentioned when uh, at the beginning of this video chat, uh, in order for me to go from lean to ripped, I had to diet longer. The same thing is going to apply for you. You need to diet longer. Three months is not long enough to lose all your excess body fat. Now, if, if you're brand new, I mean, it really depends on how much body fat you have to lose. You know, six months is usually long enough for you to make some really significant changes. But if you have a lot of weight to lose, like you are, you know, really heavy, really overweight, you know, technically obese in terms of like, let's say your body fat is up in the high 20s or 30 percent or more, then it's going to take more than just a few months to lose all that body fat. It's probably going to take a year or more in order for you to lose that excess body fat. But realize that the fact that you're you're seeing progress and you know you're you're getting leaner and you're consistent I mean, you're on the right track like keep doing what you're doing just diet longer that's going to be the, the key right there a lot of people lose patience because even though you're you're making progress instead of looking and seeing how far you've come you, you look and say well geez i've done all this work and i still have more work to do right that that's that's part of the process right it's it's not like a you know, you're going to diet for three months and boom, you're in shape. I mean, some people it's going to take a lot longer than that. So how long it takes really depends on your starting point. You know, if you're naturally lean to begin with, then yeah, you may be able to go from lean to ripped in three months. If you're naturally overweight to begin with, it's going to take a lot longer. It's going to take six months, nine months, maybe 12 months or even more depending on your starting position. But rest assured, as long as you stay consistent with it and you keep moving yourself in the right direction, then, you know, Success is inevitable. It's just a matter of time. Uh, Amittens is joining us and he says, do you need to hit each body part twice a week? I was going to try for the body for life where you hit upper and lower uh, twice every other week with cardio every other day. That, that that's, that's a variable and, and, and it really doesn't matter. I mean, you can make progress training each muscle group twice a week. You can make progress training each muscle group once a week. What really matters is the overall structure of your program. And as long as you're training all your major muscle groups with progressive overload. Uh, I, I kind of throw out some general examples that I like to use for most people. If you're a beginner to weight training, I generally like to recommend three total body workouts a week. So every other day with a total body workout, and that's a good place to start. Now, obviously, if you're doing total body workouts, you can't do a lot of different exercises for each muscle group. So even though the frequency is going to be high, the volume is going to be low. I mean, you might be only doing one or two exercises per muscle group in, in a total body workout like that. As you get more advanced, you might want to break it up into uh, maybe like a, a push-pull split or maybe an upper-lower split, something like that, or maybe you'll do like... Uh, upper body one day, lower body the next, upper body one day, lower body the next, and train like an every other day fashion. That will increase your frequency, and it will also allow you to have more training volume because now where you're breaking up your body and not doing a total body workout each time but only training half your body, you can have more volume and more exercise variety per workout. Uh, then, you know, you might want to progress from there, maybe do like a push-pull legs type of split where you're training, you're pushing muscles one day, you're pulling muscles the next, and then legs the following day. And 
by breaking it up even further, now with three workouts to hit your entire body, you'll allow more room for more exercise variety. And then if you want to take that further, you can do into a full on like bodybuilding split routine where you're only training one or two major muscle groups per workout, but able to hit those muscle groups with more variety and uh, training stimulation. It's not that one is right or wrong, better or worse, because it, they all work. I mean, you can structure and cycle through your different training styles and make progress. I mean, in, in my case, sometimes I go through total body workouts. I mean, right now I'm actually going through a total body workout program. This is what I'm doing. It's total body three days a week, and I'm enjoying it, making progress with it. it you know, once I hit a plateau with that, then I might switch it up and do like a bodybuilding split routine where I'm hitting, you know, one or two major muscle groups each day and only hitting each body part once a week. The bottom line is it's the consistency over the long term. It's not like the nitty gritty details. It's that is secondary in terms of the consistency and the mindset that goes into it. If you have the right consistency and the right mindset and you're training in a progressive fashion, you can make it work regardless of what type of split routine you're, you're following. And again, that's, it's, it's not what's holding you back. It's the consistency, the mindset, and the, the training. You can vary that based on how your body responds and based on your own personal preferences. Uh, Dennis is joining us. He says he wants to thank me for all the tips that I post on YouTube. He says it helps a lot. Well, you're welcome, Dennis. Uh, Heath is joining, and he says, you don't lose belly fat in three months. Bro, work out five days a week. Don't be a pussy. <laughs> okay. Heath is sharing some uh, man up advice there. Um, uh, therapy is joining us as egg whites and porridge for breakfast. Take note. Ronnie Coleman swears by it. Uh, Dennis has got a question saying, I don't have time for that. It's work and family and hobbies. All right. Good for you. <laughs> I'm going to tell you, everybody can use the excuse, I don't have time. And if that really comes back to what I mentioned at the very beginning of this video chat is the mindset as well as the priority and your motivation. If this is a big enough motivating factor for you, if this is a big enough why and you have enough pain for why you want to get out of your current situation and into a better one, you will find the time. If, you know, people who say, I don't have time, I'm busy, I have work, I have this, I have that. Uh, it just goes to show that your, your motivation isn't high enough. You don't have enough drive and you don't have enough uh, reason why. Like you're not a 10 out of 10. If you were a 10 out of 10 committed, you would find the time to make it work. And you would adjust your schedule accordingly. Because I can guarantee that regardless of how busy you are, we could go out there and find someone else who is either just as busy or maybe even busier and still making it work. It's just a matter of priorities and structuring your, your program accordingly. And, and again, I'm not trying to uh, be negative here. I'm just trying to be realistic. Like people who say, well, I, I don't do it because I don't have time. Again, you know, maybe you have other things in your life that are a bigger priority than your health and fitness. If that's the case, then so be it, right? But the reason is, is it just, it comes down to priorities. Because if this was a big enough priority, if this was a must do, if it was a life or death situation, you would find a way to do it, right? Okay, so let's move on. We have Heath has got more questions. Would you um, A lot of questions back and forth. Uh, again, you guys are chatting amongst yourselves, which is fine. Um, we have Dirty Jersey says, Lee, hope all is well. Is it possible to lose fat and get ripped without counting calories? Yes, it is. It, it, it is possible to lose fat and get ripped without counting calories. But what I would recommend, if, if you're new to nutrition and you've never focused on this before, you never focused on counting calories, counting macros or anything like that, I would recommend you do it for the short term so that you can understand nutrition at a higher level. Because if, if you've never done it, then you really don't know, okay, how much a, a serving of protein is. Like if, for example, if you've never counted calories or macros, then you don't have a, a benchmark for how much you should be eating. So it's it's good to do that, to develop that, that sense and that familiarity with, with foods. Like, for example, I know, okay, a cup of dry oatmeal is approximately 50 to 60 grams of carbohydrates. 
right? I, boom, I just know that, you know, like I know a typical chicken breast is going to be around 25, 30 grams of protein, depending on the size of the chicken breast. You know, if it's a bigger one, be a little more of a smaller, be a little less, but somewhere in 25, 30 grams of protein. Um, it, like a, a scoop of protein powder is going to be, you know, between 20 and 25 grams of protein. I mean, I know this kind of stuff because I've been doing it long enough. So because I, I know it, I don't really need to, um, you know, weigh and measure and track every single morsel because I have a, a benchmark of, of, of what certain things are just from, from doing this over, over several years. But if you've never tracked your nutrition before, you've never counted your calories before, then you don't know this stuff. So that's where counting your macros and counting your calories can really help you to get that uh, base level of knowledge. But once you have that base level of knowledge, then you can be a bit more intuitive with it. And uh, I'll give you an example. Like I've gotten ready for competitions without actually breaking out the food scale and, and measuring everything out because I just know through natural portion sizes where I'm to. Like, for example, a piece of fruit, like a typical apple, orange, or banana, is somewhere around 25 to 30 grams of carbohydrates, right? Boom, I just know that because I've done enough diet plans to figure it out. And, uh, you know, but if you haven't studied nutrition before, then you have no idea how many grams of protein, carbs, or fat are in certain foods. So can you do it? Yes, you can. But for someone who's new, I would recommend taking some time, even if it's only a few weeks or maybe for your first month, to go through the whole process of tracking so that you educate yourself. Once you've got that base level, then you can kind of, you get into a structured eating plan. A lot of your meals are gonna be similar from day to day, and you don't have to be as rigid with weighing and measuring everything out. Now, if you enjoy it and you find that that keeps you on track, then hey, by all means do it. But if you find that it's a pain in the ass and it's actually holding you back, then you don't necessarily have to do it as long as you're consistent over the long term, you can still make it work. Okay, someone's asking, what's your favorite pre-workout? Uh, for me, it's it's usually just a cup of coffee. <laughs> That's usually my favorite pre-workout. I have been experimenting with some different pre-workout formulas, but I will say right now, uh, my, my go-to pre-workout, the one that I've used more than any other, is just a cup of black coffee. <laughs> That's my pre-workout of choice. Uh, Wilfred saying is five days low carbs and two day refeed sounds very doable. Yes, that is a, a good strategy for a lot of people. Uh, if, if you want to diet strict five days a week and then have a little bit of flexibility, high carbs on the weekend, uh, that's a very simple diet plan that allows, you know, a carbohydrate cycle, calorie cycle, and it works well with most people's schedule. So again, diet strict five days a week and then uh, bump up the calories and carbs on the weekend. Okay, AV Bullet Catcher says, Lee, is there any truth or merit to the concept that if you consume less calories than you need for weight loss on a daily basis, your body enters starvation mode and holds on to fat? Not really. I mean, the whole idea of starvation mode... Your, your metabolism is always in fluctuation. So if you eat more calories, your metabolism will actually increase because there's the thermic effect of food, right? So, I mean, you eat more, you will actually burn more. You eat less, you will burn less. So, so there is some merit to that. But as far as starvation mode or getting to the point where your body is not going to burn uh, burn any more fat, um, it, it, it doesn't really work like that. Now, you can cycle your calories to help optimize building muscle and burning fat at the same time. And that's one of the reasons why I like doing this is not only does it help to aid with fat loss, but it helps to aid with building and maintaining lean muscle tissue as you lose the body fat. But if you follow a low calorie diet long enough, you will still lose fat. And, you know, you, you'll see this in people. I mean, you can still lose fat, but it might not be the optimal scenario for people who are trying to bodybuild, meaning build muscle and lose fat simultaneously, and also do so in a, in a fashion that they enjoy and can maintain over the long term. Because let's face it, I mean, being in a low calorie diet for the long term with no end in sight is not fun. I mean, that is kind of borderline torture for a lot of people. But if you have a structure in place where, okay, I only need to diet strict for a few days in a row and then I get a little break, diet strict for a few days in a row, get a little break, it makes it a lot more and 
you know, maintainable over the long term. And it actually makes the program a lot more enjoyable because so, when you have the structure like that, you know, you'll actually enjoy phases of, of being a little, little bit hungry. I mean, sometimes that's actually advantageous. You actually enjoy that because you don't feel full or sluggish or heavy and you just have that light uh, energetic feel from being uh, in a low calorie phase. But if you stick with that too long, then it starts to dwell on you. You know, you start to feel flat and depleted and irritable, but then you have that little high calorie phase afterwards makes the process a lot easier and vice versa. I mean, if, if you're in a caloric surplus all the time, that's no fun either because you feel heavy, bloated and sluggish. If, if you ever tried to do a prolonged bulking program, you know what I'm talking about. So I find having the, the, the natural fluctuation, you know, going through high carb phases, medium carb phases and low carb phases is actually a very enjoyable way to structure your meal plan. And it's, it pr promotes the uh, long-term, uh, you know, results as you follow consistently. Let's move on. We have Michael joining us. Eat all your food. Was it eat all your food in a 12 hour window? First thing you put in your body, morning water starts to clock. You put on more muscle, less fat. Heard it from Dr. Rhonda Patrick. All right. Oh, yeah. Oh, shoot. I lost my place there. We have. Uh, Luz is joining us. Uh, intermittent fasting can backfire if not done properly. Also, OMA if not done properly. One meal a day. I think that's what she means by that. Yeah. Uh, Michael is joining us. He says intermittent fasting is easy after day three. Dennis, who I'll mail you love and tips and advice. Good. Michael, how do you drop 59 pounds in 12 weeks? I'm... <laughs> not everybody can drop 59 pounds in 12 weeks. And what I would recommend if your goal is to lose a lot of weight, uh, give yourself a lot of time. And I'm going to give you a, a kind of a, a general guideline that you can use to, to know how, how long you need to diet for in order to lose weight. Once you get settled into a fat loss program, it's a good healthy weight loss is to lose about one pound per week. That is realistic, it's achievable, it's maintainable. Now, the way it's gonna work no normally is when you start a fat loss diet, you'll probably lose a lot of weight initially, probably even as much as half a pound a day initially, but it's not all body fat. A lot of the weight that you lose initially is gonna be water, bloat, uh, and just glycogen. It's not all body fat. I mean, majority of it is gonna be again the water, the bloat, and, and glycogen. Once you get beyond that initial phase, then you're starting to get into fat burning mode. And that's where you're gonna settle into probably a one, two pound per week weight loss. Then that's primarily gonna become from body fat, especially if you do it properly. As you get further along in the diet, the rate of weight loss is gonna slow down a bit because you have less weight to lose, but you're still able to lose it. So a realistic number to shoot for as you get into a diet plan is one pound per week. So figure out how many pounds you have to lose and be prepared to give yourself that many weeks to lose that weight. So if you have 50 pounds you wanna lose, you know, mentally be prepared to give it a year. I know that sounds like, oh my God, I, have, I can't give myself a full year to lose that weight. Well, yes, you can. A year is gonna go by regardless if you lose the weight or not. But if you take action and actually you know, move yourself towards your goal, then this time next year, you can be happy and say, whoa, you know, I just lost 50 pounds over the past year. Or you can be pissed off at yourself and probably even five or 10 pounds heavier than when you started because you didn't take any action. So mentally give yourself the time that's required. So if you have 50 pounds you wanna lose, realize that that's gonna take about 50 weeks. You know, it may, it may come off quicker. You know, I mean, that's, that's quite possible. But if you're mentally prepared to give it that much time, then your odds of success will go up dramatically. If you try and rush the process, uh, your your odds of success diminish and the odds of you actually getting frustrated and quitting and then you know having this rebound weight gain because you just say to hell with it I'm pissed like, I'm frustrated with trying to lose weight and then not working fast enough and then you go and binge that's what usually happens if you try and push it too hard too much too soon so be mentally prepared to give it the time that it needs and your odds of success are going to be much greater Uh, da, 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 da. 
Don saying, what's coming sooner, a second book or a second child? I would say a second book. I'm not planning on having any second child. That's just personal reasons. Um, okay, we have Wilfred saying, thank you, Lee, for the response. You're very welcome. We have Matt joining us. He says, what email for the book again? Been on a steady plan already, eating six small meals, dropped a lot of weight, started at 425 down to 250. Wow, congratulations, Matt. That's quite impressive. And uh, so again, the email address, if you want a free copy of my bodybuilding competition training guide, which is a six month fat loss training program specifically designed for competitive bodybuilders, but could be applicable to anybody who wants to have a serious fat loss program. The email address again is leeh at leehayward.com. So L-E-E-H at leehayward.com. And that's only going to be available to those of you who are watching this video chat. I'm not going to be sharing that email address anywhere else. You'll have to listen to this video chat in, in order to qualify for that free gift. Uh, CW1986 is highly a big fan of yours for many years. A shout out from England. Thanks for tuning in. Much appreciated. Uh, Jonas says, eating excess protein is more likely to cause smelly farts. <laughs> the dreaded protein farts, right? Uh, there's one thing you can do to actually help to minimize those protein farts, and that is digestive enzymes. This is something that I've been using lately, and I find that it works really well. And the older you get, the, the more... Uh, essential digestive enzymes are. I mean, when you're young and your digestive system is at its peak, you know, your, your body's at its peak, you can digest and utilize food and basically eat whatever you want without gas or bloating or anything like that. But as you get older, uh, you usually have more digestive issues. I mean, you, you think of people in your personal life, like a lot of times the older people have you know, there's, there's certain foods that just upset their stomach. You know, they're probably developed certain intolerances like gluten intolerance or lactose intolerance or things like that. And, and a lot of times it's, it's because they don't have enough enzymes in their body to digest these different foods. So digestive enzymes can definitely help. And this is something I've been using a lot in recent years. Like I, I take them with, with all my major meals and I find that it makes a big difference. So if you do have stinky protein farts, then you might want to be consider supplementing with digestive enzymes, especially for all your high protein meals. Um, I have another question here. What advice for people who don't get enough compliments, like people who they are around don't care about muscles and fitness? Oh, interesting. So what, what advice would I have for people who don't get enough compliments? So while I guess there is enough support from friends and family, I would look for trying to expand your circle of friends to incorporate people who are more fitness oriented. So, I mean, this is something that I discussed earlier when I was going over the mindset of, of achieving your fat loss and fitness goals. You need to have a support system and chances are you're going to be like the people you associate with. So if you're associating with people who don't care about fitness, then that's not going to help you to achieve your fitness goals. You need to associate with people who do care about fitness, who do prioritize it, and people who are going to help to pull you up to a higher level versus pull you down. So you may need to change some of the friends and uh, people that you associate with. Now, if, if it's family and stuff like that, I mean, obviously, you know, you're not going to get rid of your family, but you don't need to dwell on your family. I mean, you can choose friends who support you. You can get around environments who, who are where people are more supportive. You know, at the gym, obviously, you know, you can find people who are more supportive and more in, into fitness, attending different events, right? Like going to bodybuilding competitions, going to powerlifting meets, going to different athletic and sporting events, uh, going to any um, like trade shows, like fitness related events that may be in your area. In, and networking and developing friends and getting on social media. You can find a lot of like groups and people probably in your local area who are involved with fitness and try and associate yourself with people who are going to support you versus uh, being around people who are going to pull you down. And again, that, that applies not only for, for fitness, but anything that you want to achieve. I mean, you need to find people who have, are like-minded 
in order to achieve success in any area. All right, I'm gonna answer a couple more questions and clue it up because I know we've been going for uh, well over an hour. Uh, would you recommend uh, one hour of high intensity interval training where I burn an average of 600 calories after a weight training split workout. Some days I have to combine due to other schedule and commitments. You could, but that is very intense, right? I mean, I'm going to tell you, if, if you try and back-to-back -back high intensity weight training and high intensity cardio, you'll probably be able to do it for a little while, but eventually it's probably going to become over overload. You know, it's going to be to the point where you're actually burning the candles at both ends and borderline overtraining. I personally like to structure high intensity weight training with low intensity cardio. And that's what I do the majority of the time. Sometimes I'll throw in a high intensity, um, you know, cardio session, but more often than not, that's how I'll structure it. High intensity weight training, low intensity cardio. And again, it's, it's the opposites. So you're getting that the yin and the yang, right? Your high intensity exercise with the low intensity exercise. And I find that that allows more consistent uh, over the long term versus if you're always trying to do high intensity, high intensity, and you burn yourself out. And it also increases your risk of injury as well. So all I'm going to suggest there is listen to your body. If, if you feel that you need to take a break and, and scale back the intensity of, of those cardio sessions, then don't be, don't hesitate to do a low intensity cardio versus a high intensity cardio session. A lot of times I'll play it by ear and I'll, I'll, I'll adjust the intensity of my cardio based on my own energy levels. So if I'm scheduled to do a cardio workout and I have a lot of energy, then, hey, I might do a high intensity cardio workout. Uh, if, if I'm feeling low energy and kind of like a bit beat down and, and exhausted, then I'll do a low intensity one instead. So you can use your own individual energy levels and just kind of play it by ear. Uh, Amir is asking one gram of protein for for kilogram or for pound. Uh, usually we go by pound. I know that the grams and pounds, you got the metric and the standard in there, but 2.2 uh, grams of protein per kilogram of body weight. If, if, if you're using the metric system, that's what you want to go for. 2.2 grams of protein per, per kilogram of body weight, which works out to one gram per pound. Okay. Uh, Nick is saying, says, Lee, I have your uh, three steps. The, 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 sorry. The, yeah. Three steps for building muscle PDF. He it says it's 2016. Do you have a new version or is it still the same? Uh, the information that's covered there is still applicable today. Uh, the human body has not evolved since 2016 to the point where the workout and diet program that worked back two years ago will not work today. The same things apply today. And I mean, it focuses on, you know, the three keys to building muscle, the training, the nutrition, and the mindset. That still applies just as, just as much today as it did two years ago. Okay. All right. See here. Okay, I think that's pretty much it. We had a few other questions coming through here. Uh, is it? This is from Francisco saying, is it possible to get bigger legs training for explosive athleticism? Is it possible to get bigger bodybuilding legs training for explosive athleticism? Yes, I mean absolutely. You can still get bigger legs even if you're training to be more explosive. And a lot of times when it comes to individual body parts, your genetics will, will play a big role in determining your ultimate potential. But improvement is always possible. And if you look at a lot of, of athletes, I mean, some athletes have very big muscular legs. Some, some probably don't. But again, it, it's usually the genetics will ultimately determine, you know, your, your full potential. But regardless of where you're at, you can still make improvements regardless of your genetics. So can you get bigger legs? Absolutely. Are you going to build like absolutely massive Tom Platt's legs? Probably not. Unless you have Tom Platt's genetics, you're not going to build Tom Platt's legs. But improvement and actually making them bigger is always possible regardless of your genetics. 
All right, guys, I'm going to get ready and clue it up. I know we've gone for somewhere around an hour and 20 minutes thereabouts, so I'm going to clue it up for today. Again, for those of you who are tuned in live right now, if you would like a free copy of my bodybuilding competition training guide, it's again, it's a six month program showing you how to go from smooth to ripped, outlining every step of the process. I'm going to give you a free copy of that. Uh, just send me an email, leeh at leehayward.com, and just say, hey, I'd like, I watched your show today. I'd like a free copy of your book. And if you would like some more help with this, like if, if you have some issues that you would like to discuss, maybe you have some issues when it comes to your mindset, or maybe it's some issues when it comes to, uh, you know, achieving those goals, something that's beyond just the typical workout and diet plan. If you have some issues that you would like to discuss and come up with some different strategies, or maybe you've been doing this for a while, and even though you're eating right and exercising regularly, it's still not working for you, and you need some more advanced strategies to bust through some plateaus. If you would like some help with this, let me know in an email and we'll schedule a time to get together and we can actually have a one-on-one -on -one phone conversation and come up with some realistic strategies and an action plan that's right for you. So I'm willing to do that as a gift for you. So again, send me an email and I'll send you a copy of the, uh, the, the book. And if you want to have some more help and discuss this personally, then I'll be more than happy to help you out. So thanks for tuning in. Thanks for all the questions and, and feedback that came through there. I uh, got a lot of positive uh, encouragement for this uh, video chat today. So I hopefully uh, you enjoyed it and got some benefit from it. And I will talk to you again next week. Take care. Over and out.